Welcome into the KSO Show. I am Mason Vogt, joined by Derek Young. And it is time to preview the Cats and the Pokes. K-State and Oklahoma State getting set for a top 25 battle on Saturday at 11 a.m. in Bill Snyder Family Stadium. Second consecutive matchup between the two sides in Bill Snyder Family Stadium, where they're both in the top 25. Last year was not the case. K-State was in there, but... Uh, they did not have a good time in Stillwater, Oklahoma. And that was kind of Oklahoma State's official coming out party as the Big 12 contender that they were as they made it all the way to Arlington before losing to Texas. So we will talk Cats and Cowboys here in just a second, but also time to remind you that there is no better way to kick off the 2025 college football season than cheering on K-State and the Aer Lingus College Football Classic in Dublin, Ireland. The Cats will square off with the Iowa State Cyclones on August 23rd, 2025. Whether it's a quick trip to Dublin for the game, a multi-city adventure throughout the Irish countryside, or exploring the Emerald Isle on your own, there is a package for you. Visit Cats2Ireland.com for information on official travel and hospitality packages. That's Cats, the number two, Ireland.com. All right, let's get into it. K-State, Oklahoma State this weekend. Two teams that started the year in the top 25. Both got up pretty high inside the top 15, but both opened Big 12 play with losses to schools from the state of Utah. Utah took care of business down in Stillwater over the weekend, and K-State had a nasty game with BYU in Provo. Which team are you more down on after their disappointing opening weekend to Big 12 play? Uh, between these two, right? These two. Okay, because there's a few. Um, I, I, I'm probably more down on Oklahoma State, and I know that sounds like the Homer way to go, but they just weren't really competitive against Utah. Uh, they made it the score look a little bit better than it was by by scoring as late as they did, but things were so bad they had to bench Alan Bowman, So, and Utah didn't even play their starting quarterback. Cam Rising wasn't available. Yeah. Add, in, add into that that the Oklahoma State formula that worked for them last year that got them to Arlington, and obviously they didn't figure that out until they played Kansas State uh, in Stillwater. But that formula is just not there this year. They are not running the ball, and they are not playing defense. So it's hard for me to feel good about a team that is having to rely heavily on a quarterback that they had to bench, right? So that. That's where I'm at, and I'm really kind of perplexed. I, like, And I know teams are trying to take away Ollie Gordon, and that makes it tougher, but it shouldn't be impossible, especially with that entire offensive line returning. Yeah, no, no doubt about it. I, I'm with you. It's Oklahoma State that I'm more down on because look, K-State's game, it happens. Road game, night one of the better environments in the big 12 and Maybe just some better. fluky stuff happens to you. And and then it kind of spirals away and you can't, nope. yeah, you can't keep yourself in it. The mistakes there are things that may not ever happen again, or are a little bit easier to correct than what Oklahoma state has. That's been a problem this year has been kind of a trend for them through four games. It's not been corrected. And these are things that you may just not ever get fixed. And I kept saying throughout the offseason and as the season started that what people fail to kind of realize sometimes when you have a good season and then you bring a lot of key pieces back from that, that, well, yes, you could get better and you think that you should keep some type of level around that. There's also a real chance that you played out your best case scenario season last year. And for Oklahoma State, it's kind of kind of starting to seem that way. Alan Bowman is, is in the seventh year of college football. He is not the reason that Oklahoma State was a good football team last year. And, you know, again, he didn't play all that game against Utah. Uh, So maybe there are some cracks there. Ollie Gordon, phenomenal season last year. But now everybody knows that Ollie Gordon can be the stud. And the offensive lines had a tougher time blocking for Ollie Gordon this year. Their pass blocking has still been really good. We'll talk about that in a little bit. But I saw this stat from PFF. uh, An Oklahoma State site was actually talking about it earlier this week and it mentioned that last year ollie gordon's yards after contact was 60 percent his yards after contact this season is 83 percent so there is a pretty big difference right now in how quickly ollie gordon is getting hit and what is being done there and you can see it play out in the the yards per carry category he was 3.5 through the first four games this season whereas he was 6.3 
last year. Uh, it's been a wildly different year for him, and he hasn't scored a touchdown in the last two games for Oklahoma State. He's pretty much been a non-factor for them, uh, really since the South Dakota State game where they ran him like 30 times in that game to get him to his total and everything. So they're struggling there. Uh, and then you mentioned Bowman was was benched for moments in, in exchange for Garrett Rangel during the loss against Utah. Um that's it's just not a good situation for Oklahoma State right now in offense. And then defensively, to back up what you said about them not playing the defense, number one, Colin Oliver got hurt in that game against Arkansas. But on the season right now, Oklahoma State is giving up 180 yards rushing per game and 281 yards passing per game. They are getting gashed, and they've been fortunate in some categories that they were able to win that Arkansas game and fare better in some of the others as well. So they're, they're struggling right now, and they're not able to get the, the right recipe like they had it last season. One, Oklahoma State doesn't have a win as impressive as Kansas State does, 31-7 to over Arizona. May um, not even have one as impressive as the Tulane win. Yeah, so that's, that's another way to kind of delineate these two teams. Another one is that Kansas State basically fell in one of the better environments in the nation because they basically shot off their foot every way imaginable for a good six minutes of game time. And then there was nothing that they could do after that because they were too one-dimensional in offense at that point. On the flip side, what's ailing Oklahoma State isn't like a fluke, like we killed ourselves here or we killed ourselves there. It is their their issue is the exact fabric of the team. They don't have an easy route to victory right now because – if Ollie Gordon's not going to get going, can you do you really have a good enough quarterback? You don't. So it, it it's rough. Yeah, no, no doubt about that. It's going to be fascinating to see how things play out for them. A uh, couple of stylistic things to keep in mind in this game. I mentioned that while Ollie Gordon is getting hit a lot quicker this season, and that's kind of tamping down his numbers. The pass blocking has been strong, and that's to the tune of only one sack has been allowed this year by Oklahoma State through four games. That's the best mark in the Big 12, and K-State's in a position where Brendan Mott has come off to a really good start. Toby Austin Sonmi had a good game early in the year. Um, I think that's one of those matchups in this game that will be one of the most important things is the K-State defense in terms of how they're able to get in the backfield and then the Oklahoma State offensive line trying to prevent it from happening like they've done against many teams this year. No, I mean, I, I their pass protection has been okay, um, and they're protecting Alan Bowman, of course. But I just – I. It doesn't. Re- I'm, I'm a little flummoxed, I guess, as to why that they can be so conversely different between run blocking and pass blocking. Um, but part of that, I also think, is if they're with being an RPO centric offense, there's yeah. not a lot of opportunities for sacks too. Yeah. So the ball gets out really quick. It's, it does. it's the the offense. This is the perfect offense for Alan Bowman, who's a limited quarterback, yep. to get the ball out quick, giving the easy looks if they're there. And because I mean, they put the ball in the air 60% of the time to 40% on the ground. So, yeah, you're right about that. that and and, and teams are giving them the look to, to also not give the ball to Gordon in his RPO situations. Mm-hmm. So, if he's going to go read it the right way, he's going to pull it and he's going to throw it. That's what teams want him to do. Now, yeah. you just say screw it and give it to Gordon anyway. Probably not, not the way it's going. Yeah, and and that's I mean you go and look at how things have kind of gone. They've tried that at times this yeah. year to to see how that ends up working out, and it's not necessarily gone the the best. Ollie Gordon through four games has seventy three carries, and if you go and look uh, what they did early in the year, they gave it to him twenty eight times against South Dakota State. They had him run it for seventeen times for forty nine yards against Arkansas, seventeen for forty one against Tulsa. Now, his average was a little bit better against Utah, but they got down so big that they had to put it in the air more. So he only ran the ball 11 times against the Utes over the weekend. So that was more of a circumstance of the scoreboard. I think Oklahoma State is still planning on being pretty stubborn, at least early in the game, and how many times they give it to Ollie Gordon. Um, I think the thing for K-State would be, though, you feel good about 
Alan Bowman having to be the guy to beat you. So just try and get yourself in a position early on and see how it goes. The other defensive note for K-State that I would say in this game is we, we talk about getting the ball out quick and all these other things, and, and that makes the receiver matchup important. But these Oklahoma State guys have shown the ability to make things happen yards after the catch, um, which is something that um, K-State was good at limiting against Arizona. Now there's a little bit of an air yardage discrepancy between Arizona and Oklahoma State. But – this is a big game for the secondary because you just got back from Joe Klanderman and Connor Riley's press conference, and Klanderman said that his secondary needs to be better. Alan Bowman was the most interception-worthy quarterback in the Big 12 last season. He threw 14 picks. He's thrown four through two games this season, or four games this season, including two on Saturday against Utah. This is a big game in my mind for Keenan Garber, Jacob Parrish, and Marquis Siegel, who – Really needs to get and Jordan Riley to throw in there, but those other three guys have been here now for multiple years. They need to be ready not just to tackle these guys, but also go out there and make you some plays every once in a while. Yeah, the, the secondary is really a perplexing kind of situation, um, in my opinion. Kansas State, despite much of a pass rush last year, I think was number two in pass defense efficiency in the entire Big 12. Uh, that's impressive, and they bring back four of those five starters if you count Keenan Garber, who basically got a starter amount of snaps last year. The only newbie being Jordan Riley, who's, what, a fourth, fifth-year senior. So uh, it's a little bit stunning that they have struggled as much as they do. And, and you know, talking to Joe Klanderman today, he's, he, he kind of referred to, like, in both the Tulane game and then, again, this past Saturday at BYU, just their, when they're in man coverage, the pass-offs have just not been – been there for whatever reason is it a lack of communication guys seeing different things differently um either way it's got to get cleaned up or they're going to continue to get exploited in that way because teams are watching the film of that and seeing where you're getting it wrong and then they're going into their playbook and finding exactly what they have that they can unload against it uh, and expose its its flaws so until it gets cleaned up it, it's kind of a kind of a concern. Yeah, that's that's an important deal for K State this weekend. So it'll be uh, interesting to keep an eye on and see how those guys perform. Because I mean, so much of it, it's they've had guys in position at times, and they're just not going up and finding the ball. So it's kind of crazy to think about uh, their situation there. And the turnovers will play a role in this. I mean, Oklahoma State's defense, uh, they've got five picks so far this season. That's the most in the Big Twelve. They've also been really good at, when the ball is loose, recovering the fumble. K-State's kind of had the opposite of that, where uh, I believe the only fumble that K-State's recovered this year of, I think, the four that they've maybe forced, they've recovered, and it was the Jack Fabris fumble for a touchdown um, that happened against Tulane. So some of that turnover luck is in there, and now as a defense, you kind of have to go out and make your own luck at times too. So that'll be uh, another thing worth noting and watching this weekend as it plays out. Now, in terms of what the, you think the K-State offense looks like this weekend after a week against BYU where they got off to a good start, but they couldn't finish drives, Fan told us on Sunday that through the first two drives, K-State gained 90% of the available yards. Their second drive totaled 102 yards. They only scored six points on those two drives combined. What are your expectations for the K-State offense this weekend, and what can they do to exploit Oklahoma State's defense, which is off to a little bit of a struggling start? Well, clearly you got to take care of the ball, and you got to be better in the red zone because, I mean, I've said it. I don't know that I've said it to you. I've said it in, in a multi multitude of other places. Look, as bad as that thing got in Provo, they lost 38 to freaking 9, right? It got pretty freaking bad. I fully believe this. If – and I know that there was more than these errors, but these errors were significant due to timing. If Avery Johnson comes off that first read and instead bailing on a clean pocket, finds who a wide open Will Swanson, who got wide open in the middle of the end, excuse me, middle of the end zone on second and five, you know, the second and five that I actually criticized Connor Riley for throwing the ball. Well, his actual play call was turned out to be brilliant. And I was a stupid idiot because he had a guy go wide open in the middle of the end zone. Will Swanson. But Avery Johnson didn't go through his reads and progressions. He got a little antsy in the pocket. He bailed, never saw him. Incomplete pass. It turns into a field goal. The other one that turned into a field goal, 
correct me if I'm wrong, I think had a touchdown to Keegan Johnson that was called back because of an offensive line penalty. And if that goes to a and that the offensive line doesn't commit that penalty, you're up 14 to zero and pretty quickly against BYU. And I feel strongly about this. If that actually happened and they went up 14 0 in BYU and Provo because of how that game script plays out, Kansas State runs the piss out of the ball the rest of the way and they probably cruise to a win. Yeah. And it's kind of the same story for if you're thinking about the two lane game where K State early on. They got the stops that they needed and wanted on defense, and then they go down the other way, and they just they can't get the ball into the end zone. They had to settle for that uh, for that field goal early on in the game. So I, I think that's where I, I'm with you. Like I, I fully believe that game plays out differently if K State is just able to finish those those drives with touchdowns. Instead, they weren't, and uh, you you let a team hang around long enough when the crowd is going to get behind them. You can't let those crazy things happen like they did, and BYU took full advantage of it. And, and look, BYU, they've got talent. They're they're a better team than expected this year. They proved that by going 3-0 and, and blowing out two of their opponents in the non-con. Uh, I mean, one of them was a road win against SMU that wasn't the blowout that was impressive. But K-State hurt themselves, and that's a game where – you don't know if BYU went out and actually won that game, but K-State knows for a fact that they went out and lost that game themselves. BYU is good enough that if you give them a game, they will take it, which yep. I don't I don't think they, they were good enough to do that last year. But this and year they are. take it and put it away like they right. did because they executed well enough on offense when given the short fields to kind of put the hammer down and just knock K-State out of the building. So, yeah. so uh, credit again, to them for that. My big thing is don't beat yourself – because you're still making enough plays on offense to be good enough, I think, even with a miles to go in terms of development, whether it be at the quarterback position, whether it be chemistry and cohesion across the offensive line. Um, the tight ends obviously need to improve now that they're banged up a bit. You have a really good running game that hasn't been stopped once this year. I mean, because of the way the Kansas State's able to run the ball and has run the ball and that no team has been able to stop it. Not that they've ran it against any great run defenses yet. I get it. Although you all used is not bad in case they ran all over them when given the chance. Yeah. The game script just kind of got them away from that. You go down 31 to six, you can't run the ball. Right. But like basically the fabric of K-State's team right now, if they get a lead uh, and not just six, Oh, like if you, if they get like a 10 point lead plus, the way that they are structured, I mean, that game could be cooked pretty quickly. So, again, I said it last week, didn't happen, but, man, a hot start. K-State gets up on a team 10-0, 14-0, just a hot start in any game this year. I have a hard time seeing them lose. And, and obviously, it's like, well, yeah, if you don't lose a 10- or 14-point lead. Well, definitely not the way you can run the ball. And, yeah. Kansas, and nobody has stopped Kansas State from running the ball this year. Now – Except themselves. Te te yeah. Teams are going to – figure it out at some point. And I say figure it out. Maybe they won't um, because as one dimensional as they are, they're still able to run the ball so far, but there's going to be a team or two that sells out and takes away the run game enough. And that's when you need why well, you need every Johnson to keep making considerable games from week to week. So that whenever that time comes, you're ready and, and able to pass the ball. Yeah, no doubt about it. What do you expect from Avery Johnson and the K state passing game this weekend? Because Things have not looked great, but I do think people should realize that Jace Brown has had basically three good games, one game against Tulane where he only had one catch, wasn't all that noticeable. And then Keegan Johnson, even though the numbers don't look as big, after the the first game, I actually think that he's made some timely catches for K-State. I have no kind of complaints with his they, play. Yeah, and they missed him for probably – and I can – reflect on the three different touchdowns they missed him on. And then he had a, another touchdown where he got, got called back for a holding or whatever yeah. it was against uh, BYU. Now he is playing well and he's their best blocker on the perimeter too. Um, I, what I expect from Avery Johnson is that it's going to be easier for him this week. Look for these young players. There's a reason why they are tangibly different players at home versus on the road. This will be a controlled environment you're in your comfort zone. The game is not as sped up. It's slowed down. There's not communication issues. There's less to think about. There's less to be concerned over. So you 
can play a little faster while the game is a little bit slower. Those reads kind of come to you a little bit more naturally. Uh, you can see the field a little bit better. I So I don't know, like, from a number standpoint or an observation standpoint of what to expect. All I would say is, is that what we saw last week is not necessarily Avery Johnson. That's Avery Johnson in his first true road start in a freaking raucous environment. And that's hard for someone doing it for the first time. He's not – uh, a miracle worker, as, and I'm just as guilty as everyone else that thought he was so talented that you'd be able to skip these steps of growing pains. Well, you can't, um, and and he's not. But he can get considerably better on a weekly basis as long as he puts in the work, and I think we can assume that he's, and from knowing who he is, that he will put in that work. But it will be easier for him this week. And maybe they need to get him some easy throws, uh, easier said than done. But I think Kyle Riley's also schemed up a lot more stuff than, we, than even I would give him credit for this year. Just re-watching the BYU game, it's like, man, <clears throat> there was five touchdowns. I counted, and, and that's just the touchdowns. There was a lot of other plays that were there for the taking that Kansas State didn't execute and, and got lost in it. And then when you get down big, you come one-dimensional and BYU can kind of tee off on you. But um, there, there is some situational calls that kind of make me scratch my head a little bit or, or raise an eyebrow. Um, and that kind of probably comes with the process of a young offense play caller, at least in his first year doing it. He's only done it four or five times now. But for the most part, he's he's really, from a schematic standpoint, has them prepared because there, there is stuff open. Mm-hmm. But – whether it's an offensive line protecting for a tick longer, Avery staying in the pocket and going through his reads the way a quarterback is supposed to do so, or the wide receiver not dropping the ball. I mean, all those are problems. They're not all of them are not problems every play. It's always one of them is wrong. So it's there. They're not as far off as it seems. And Connor Riley's not as bad as some of these people think he is. I would agree with that. I, we've seen, I mean, he's been able to scheme guys wide open in the red zone, which can be difficult. As you mentioned, they had two touchdowns taken off the board against BYU this past weekend because of penalties. And he does need to find probably a better feel for the game in certain situations and his play calling, but it also becomes hard to do that when penalties are multiplying the downs and the yardages that you're having to convert on. I would compare it to, you know, everybody, we, we all kind of laughed at it because it was kind of a funny thing to, to bring up and say, but. Think back to two seasons ago and that Liberty Bowl that KU played in against Arkansas where basically after the game, people were like, why is Jason Bean chucking the ball 30 rows up behind the back of the end zone? And KU was basically like, we ran out of all of our plays there. And to a lesser extent, that's kind of what's going on right now with Connor Riley where in some of these circumstances, it's like, well, he just picked up the second and five, but now he's got second and 15 or he's facing third and 12 instead of third and seven. And he, he just picked up the first down. He just had the touchdown. Well, now you're backing him up and making him do it again. And that, that becomes really tough to do. So um, six, six I'll red, give him some credit there. Six red zone penalties last week, I believe. Yeah. Yeah. And excuse me, which is, I mean, even worse when you consider that 75% of the penalties case they had last week, they only had eight in that game. So uh, it'll be fascinating to follow along to see how that's cleaned up. You would think that it's better at home this weekend with K-State having the crowd on their side. And, and that's not to take – what because I know someone is probably listening to us screaming screaming in his, his or her car or in his or her room or office or whatever it may be. I was like, well, penalties, you, coaches have to take responsibility for that too. I, I, hey, you're, you're not wrong. Um you know, that's your team. At the end of the day, it falls on the coaches that do that. I'm just talking from a play calling perspective. I don't – situationally, you know, there, there are times I'm like, man, what's what's the thought there? But the penalties – some of the players get some onus there too. And credit to BYU. I think four of those six is right in front of the BYU student section too. Yeah. So you could tell that the atmosphere got to the, the offense. Well, and in some ways like – the penalties that are being committed here, those aren't necessarily things that a coach really has much say in. Like, normally it's pretty easy to say, hey, don't move until the ball is snapped. Uh, Don't don't walk 
20 yards up the field if we're we're throwing the football offensive linemen. Like those are things that it's like I can think of times where my dad would say to, to me and my brothers growing up, these shouldn't be things that I have to tell you. Like you should just know that's kind of this situation here where you can do as much as you can, but the stupid kid in the back of the class that's not paying attention, he's still not going to learn the thing. So it's on them to take ownership and come through and and you know be respectful for themselves and get it to happen. And that's where this offensive line sits right now. There's only so much that Connor Riley can do. And I'm sure based on the nature of Connor Riley, he is giving it to these guys when they're going on because these coaches, they take it a whole lot harder, even more than they already do, when it's their own position group that's causing it. And most of these penalties have come from Connor Riley's offensive line. But at the end of the day, it's up to the individual players to figure it out because it's not like they're committing a ton of holding penalties or things that are technique or coaching based. It's just you got to use your head a little bit better if you're the offensive line right now. Yep. All right. Uh, we will get back to talking K-State, Oklahoma State in a little bit when we give our game MVPs and our predictions for what takes place. But it's time to move on to best bets our look around college football and uh, our three favorites that we have on the board this week. Another rough, another rough week for this guy, I think. Yeah, we both went one and two last week. Uh, that's another one and two week for D.Y. Didn't go the best for him. Here's a recap of last week's best bets. Colorado, they at least cashed the minus one and a half in a miracle way for me, by the way. I'm not going to act like uh, that's anything special. TCU, boy, they uh, did not want to play at all. And then USC, uh, Michigan's defense found a way to do enough and set them up. Uh, I was on the and I was on the other side of that than you, so I, yeah, I, that wasn't one of my best bets, but I had it right <laughs> that game. Uh, TCU. Meanwhile, had, uh, your two of your unders there, pretty much early in the game, we knew yeah, they no weren't team. happening. <laughs> Well, Memphis Navy had no chance. I like who who in the hell thought that would turn into a, a shootout? Yeah. Think, by the way, Memphis Navy, the total in that game ended up being one hundred. Yeah, I think Navy scored fifty six points. They or did. Memphis did, or someone did. Yeah, Navy so won fifty six to forty four. They got the they got the over just by themselves. So that as bad as you got TCU wrong, uh, I got Memphis Navy just as wrong. Ohio State Marshall probably would have been fine if Marshall didn't score fourteen points or how many. They get more than 14? Yeah. Uh, they scored 14 in the first. It was only 28 to 14 at halftime. So that's yeah. that's where your issue stems from. Is uh, I, I thought Ohio State would shut them out. I know that's weird. You don't expect it to shut out, but like Ohio State's defense is really good. Yeah. Ohio State, yeah. 49 14 was the final score there. So if I if they would have got the shutout there, I would have been fine. Yep. I think Utah, Oklahoma State's probably the best bet on that screen. It's the only one that was a lock. Yeah. That, that's a, that was a great one right there. Uh, two backup level quarterbacks in that game uh and then two defenses that are normally really stout so that one a good one there all right here is a look at what we got cooked up for week five uh dy i will let you go first as a lot of big 12 emphasis this week for throughout. both of us yeah, yeah both of us uh texas tech two and a half uh are, are i don't understand like why we're giving cincinnati a bunch of credit for beating houston 34 to nothing and i think texas tech might have figured something out. So I'm going to fade Cincinnati and also start to like and think that Texas Tech's going to play to the form that we expected at the beginning of the season. So that seems like – and maybe I'm going to get cooked there because that just seems like an obvious one to me. Colorado, another obvious one. Do we really like UCF's defense? I certainly don't. No. I think that game could be a shutout. Colorado, 23 and a half. They just got that on Baylor. And and, and Baylor's not a good defense. And, and this game will probably be faster paced. I don't know. I like I like Colorado to score more than 23 and a half points, even if it is on the road. And then Josh Hoover, TCU. Uh, this was more of a game script thing. Your gunslinger. Uh, yeah, this is more of a game script thing. It's wild that this was the line, though. But like if TCU Kansas is going to be competitive, TCU is going to run the crap or throw the crap out of the ball. And if Kansas finally figures it out and, and, and has a lead or whatever, you know what I mean? I just think the yeah. game script is going to force TCU to throw the ball a lot. And they already want to throw the ball a lot. Yeah. So 
Yeah. Josh Hoover already 162 pass attempts this season. He's gone over that 325 number in three of the four games. The only one he didn't was the 45 nothing shutout of Long Island. So yeah, that's a uh, that's a good call there, especially between two teams that very well could go back and forth with each other. Or it, th- that this is either a game to me that feels like it's back and forth, or KU gets a big enough lead to where TCU's yeah. chucking it. Both, the, the only game scripts I can see here is for Josh Hoover to chuck the ball because TC is not going to have a comfortable lead at any point. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right. I go with BYU money line at Baylor. They're plus 130. Little fishy in some ways, but boy, Baylor sucks. You guys know that I'm a Dave Aranda hater. Um, so BYU is good enough, I think, to overcome that. There is a scenario where they lose this game just given – you know, coming off the high of the K-State game, going on the road. I believe it's an early kick, but I have a hard time seeing how that BYU team that I saw in front of me could do what, you know, I could lose to Baylor. Because K-State goes to Waco, I don't think that there's even a remote chance that they could lose the game 38-9, to even with some of the stuff that BYU was able to do to K-State. See, I'm a little bit different there. Um, I know it's wild that Baylor is the favorite. But and and I don't like Dave Aranda as a coach either. But I, I'll put it this way: B that like I said, that BYU win that's just not replicable what they did yeah. to Kansas State. So now I think they're getting too much credit. Like Baylor's probably better than SMU, and BYU had a, a whale of a time with them. And Baylor should have beat Colorado. Ba- BYU plays Kansas State nine more times, they don't beat K-State. Oh, so. I see. I Now, you think you think SMU is worse than Baylor? I do. Oh. By a lot. By a lot. Boy. I, I, I think SMU would get cooked by Colorado when Baylor should have beat Colorado. It's a low bar. That is a low bar for, for Baylor. To but that's why we're off there, but we'll see. Yeah, that, that's true. That's the disconnect. I don't think SMU is good, but I think that there's still a little bit more juice there. Um, than that. Uh, I take OU minus two and a half at Auburn, despite the fact that Jackson Arnold is going to ride the pine and uh, they're going to give it to Michael Hawkins. I just, I'm, Oklahoma's defense is, is really good and Auburn has just looked disgusting. I agree. So, but here, here's what I go back to and why I, I chose to stay away from this one. If I was going to bet it, I would bet Oklahoma like you did. But why it's not a best bet to me is you basically you have a quarterback in his first start at Jordan Hare Stadium, yeah. which is known to be like, uh, where miracles like literally happen there, like literally. Um, Auburn lost to New Mexico State. What was it the other year? And then, then damn near beat Alabama in the Iron Bowl. So, yeah, that's true. Uh, I don't see it though. I just, I think I that's how much I believe in the Oklahoma defense currently. Uh, yeah. And I think you know they have this whole week to prepare for it. They'll be good. Go. My last one. Hater right now. So yeah. Uh, Arizona plus eleven and a half at Utah. My week. There's a there's a chance that coming off this bye week and with the the talent that Arizona has that they could realistically win this game I think just because depending on Cam Rising status and everything else that's going to be a fascinating one to kind of follow and see how it goes and Noah yeah. Fafita and Tedero and McMillan they're not just going to quit being good football players because the rest of their team isn't as good um, I think that game stays within that number at least and again there's a wild scenario that if you've got more money than Mason Voth, you're like, I'll put at least five bucks down money line on Arizona here or something. The, the way I would bet that game is a little bit different than you too. So it's funny we're seeing these <laughs> things. I, I think you're right. I think Arizona could win that game just because of the circumstances. But here's what I think. I think Arizona wins or Utah covers. I don't think there, there's the medium ground in between. Yeah, that's a, that's a fair, fair point. Uh, very much aligned with thinking that I could go th- zero and three this week, but I so do see uh, I do see the scenario where I'm I'm three and I, I like all of yours. I like. I, 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 I mean, I, I there's zero and three on the table for me because I think TCU sucks. So that even and now Josh Hoover can do that and they can still suck. Don't don't get me wrong, but TCU's down bad. And, well, and the Big Twelve may just be the worst league to to bet on because of how yeah, right topsy it's turvy very, it is. Very volatile. <laughs> Yeah, uh, I'd call it right over 23 and a half. I feel good about it, but damn, if everyone else is right, UCF wins by like almost three touchdowns, like the books think might happen. That opened up at 11 and a half. I was like, man, that's too big. And now it's like at 15 or 16. It got bet up even yeah. more. So everyone's on UCF like big time. I'm not there. I'm not there either. I'm not there. Um, and then Texas Tech. 
uh, it looks obvious to me. I love it, but I've I loved my other Texas Tech bets that all died too. So, yeah, actually, I mean, everybody knows that. In addition to being a Dave Aranda hater, um, I'm also a Colorado and Dion hater. But I really I look at this like I think Colorado could win this game this weekend, and it doesn't mean that Colorado is better than what people thought. It's just UCF chance they're not as good as some people were yeah, trying to make it out to be. I, I don't think Colorado is good because I won't go to that far, obviously. But if they hang around in games, yep, and they and they hung around in games last year. If they hang around in games, Travis Hunter is just going to go win them a game like almost every week. That's like true. that guy is that special. They had no business beating Baylor, but Travis Hunter was just the best player on the football field, and that's all that mattered. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, our uh, best bets from K-State, Oklahoma State this weekend. I'm taking the Cats minus five. D.Y. has those state. I think he sent me 24 and a half. I put 23 and a half. Either one, I'm going to give you credit for if it happens. So uh, there you go. Just friendly uh, odds making by me for you. Um, for me, pretty self-explanatory. I, I just I think Oklahoma State is the team I trust less right now. The last time they were in Bill Snyder Family Stadium, they were in kind of an, an awkward spot and they got housed. I don't think it's that bad this weekend. You know, it's 48 to zero. No, I, I don't think it's that bad. But K State is going to be pretty well motivated. They played one of their worst games of the season that they could possibly play last weekend. I think they'll be ready. They'll play better this weekend. And uh, I, I, Oklahoma State is a team right now. They are playing like a team that, even though they were up towards the top and they're still in the top 25 they're looking more like a seven win team, which is unheard of for Mike Gundy, but they're looking more like a seven win team than they are a team that could win nine games or more and get to the big 12 title game. I agree. And as unimpressive as their defense has been, I'm more down on their offense. Kansas state was rough defensively against Tulane bounce back, played a really good game against Arizona against an offense better than this one and held them to seven points. And if they get a lead, they'll probably run the crap out of the football, maybe lower possessions. I have a hard time seeing Oklahoma State get that number. All right. Good with me. All right. Big 12 scoreboard time. Moving on, looking around the Big 12. We've already talked about a handful of these games in one way or the other because of our best bets this week. Yeah. First game, BYU at Baylor. The Cougars in the top 25 at number 22. They're three and a half point fa- or three and a half point dogs at Baylor, who is the favorite. I obviously like Baylor, but uh, you're feeling the Bears here. I feel in the Bears. They're at home. I think BYU is going to be one of those teams this year. And it's probably Jekyll and Hyde um, from home and away. Baylor, like I said, like they should have won. They should have beat Colorado last week. So is, is there a big gap between BYU and Colorado? Probably not. Baylor's at home. Yeah. Moving on, another game earlier in the day, TCU at KU at Arrowhead Stadium. We think KU minus one and a half <laughs> taking on the Horn Frogs. Um <laughs> If KU doesn't get right in this one, this is like a carbon copy of the situation they walked into with West Virginia last weekend. Then you can probably throw this this season away for them because TCU, they struggled last week. Their defense couldn't stop anybody. Uh, they also made some crucial errors. The KU defense has playmakers that can take advantage of crucial errors, and they started to showcase a little bit last week that if you just give the ball to your running backs, you're going to be a okay. I think KU wins this one. I know it's not at David Booth Memorial Stadium, but they're at home. Hopefully at Arrowhead Stadium. I guess that's still up in the air. Uh, and I think TCU is one of the three worst teams in the Big 12. Yeah. There's a chance that the only team TCU is better than is Houston. So Kansas has to win this. I, yeah. Yeah, no doubt about it. Uh, and don't worry, KU will play there this week, and they just may not have anything in writing yet, and so who knows what that looks like. Uh, UCF Colorado, they get big noon down there, but they're kicking off at 2.30. UCF, like you said, that massive number here. I just have a hard time seeing UCF beating anybody by that number in the Big 12, especially when you consider UCF, it took quite the comeback to win by one point on the road in Fort Worth two weeks ago. Colorado's got a lot more talent. Um, I I think Colorado could straight up win this game on Saturday. I don't think you're wrong. Um, I'll, I'll ask it to you this way. Which version of Colorado is better, last year's team or this year's team? This year's team. And easy, right? Mm-hmm. Colorado played with like Utah last year on the yeah. road, I think. They only lost by like seven, I want to say. 
Yeah. Like they were in so many close games. Like they went what four and eight or five and seven last year, missed a bull, but like damn near every single one of their losses is by a touchdown or less. I now you're expecting me to say a better Colorado team is going to go to the bounce house and lose by more than two touchdowns. I have a hard time believing it, but maybe we're silly because there is a lot of people that love the Knights right now. Yeah. Uh, next game, Cincinnati at Texas Tech. We know how you feel. Tech yeah. minus two and a half. I'm in the same boat. Cincinnati has, yeah, great fake win good. over Houston, fake. who's the worst team in the league. I don't even want to say fake good. Cincinnati's just like fake okay. I, like The, the record looks fine for now, but it's not going to look fine in a couple of weeks. Uh, we'll, move, think, we'll move on. Yeah, I, one more thing. Do, do you think Texas Tech can like, beat the crap out of them? I think yeah, it's they possible. can. Yeah. It's very possible. Uh, Houston, only 14-point underdogs at home <laughs> against Iowa State. Uh, another line that you'd say, does this really make any sense? But there's some there's some wild card in Houston. We saw them go to OU and kind of battle there and then just get their butt kicked by UNLV and Cincinnati. So who knows with Houston and Iowa State's offense has looked up and down at times this year, but they had a massive week against Arkansas State. Iowa State probably covers, but this would be one of those games that you definitely should not feel okay about if you're betting on it because it's it's a true toss up with these two teams. I think one's a, a good toss up, one's a bad toss up. I think there's a chance that Iowa State isn't able to score enough to cover. There's that yeah. chance. Uh, final game of the night, Big Twelve after dark. These guys only have to wait until nine fifteen. So screw you, ESPN. <laughs> Utah minus eleven and a half. They are hosting Arizona. Um, I. I don't know the full status of Cam Rising yet. I think that's probably still up in the air, as has basically been the last two seasons of Cam Rising. So who knows? We he He's probably, as of now, going to play, and then two minutes before kickoff, it will be like, well, he was never going to play, dumbass. So uh, I don't know what to make of this game, other than the fact that I think Arizona keeps it closer than the 11 and a half. Um, I'm a Arizona upset or Utah big. That's where I am. Also, if you want a, a line of the week, Brent Brennan in his press conference uh, was asked about what the difference between Cam Rising and Isaac Wilson was. He replied with a decade of college football experience. So shout out Brent Brennan. <laughs> Accurate. Yeah, I like that. Uh, all right, we'll go back to K-State, Oklahoma State as we wind things down here and give our game MVPs and picks uh, for K State offensively, if they are to win this game, who are you taking to be the offensive MVP? I kind of am leaning towards Jace Brown just because I think there will be. Now, they might just run the crap out of football. So maybe I should take a running back and, and that's the easy pick. But I think there'll be a concerted effort to kind of break through a little bit in the passing game and, and Avery's favorite targets, Jace Brown. Yeah. All right. I like that. Offensively, I, I kind of lean the same way. I think DJ Giddens has a big game, but you see the passing defense numbers for Oklahoma State. You think that somebody could make something happen. Um, Jace Brown wasn't even a thought and in the rotation last year when these two teams played. Um, I side with you on Jace Brown because I think just any receiver could step up and have a big week, and K-State needs it. So I would go there as well. Defensively, uh, I am going to say Keenan Garber has to be the guy because of the DBs right now, he's shown to be the most ball hawk minded and Alan Bowman will give you some opportunities. I think it's just more of a mindset and a tone that Keenan Garber has to help set. And then hopefully the other guys follow along. Um, but for me, it just comes down this game. It's about two specific positions for K-State have to get figured out receiver and the DBs, and if those guys do it, K-State should be able to win this game. Yeah, when Keenan Garber was right, the defense was right, uh, obviously against Arizona. And, and other times he hasn't been right, and the defense kind of sunk a little bit. I th I tend to think like along the same lines as you, and I came out with Marquis Siegel just because like the errors that they're having, the, the stuff that's going on, He's got to be better, and and he's the one that's capable of getting everybody else in line, in my opinion. Yeah. So I just kind of look at him and be like, if you're a Sunday level player, let's see it, let's prove it. And if you're the captain and the, the guy that's going to take ownership and accountability of this thing, let's let's get it turned around and and you be the one to do it. We because we heard like in the locker room 
halftime of the Tulane game, he was the one speaking up, and I love it. Um, I just got to see some of those results now, in my opinion. You could also yeah. you could also factor in maybe a defensive tackle here or or like Austin remain at linebacker just because, I mean, the number one goal will be to take away Ollie Gordon, I would imagine, because it would be silly to me, or maybe I'm just – thinking too simply, but it would be silly to me to not just follow the blueprint that everybody else has used yeah. uh, that has worked against the Oklahoma State offense all year. Yeah, and, and on Marquis Siegel, real quick, like outside of the BYU game, he's been pretty good despite not having an impact in terms of like breaking up balls or getting interceptions. Um, so if he just puts that in, he, he'll be in a good spot. And then you mentioned the tackles on defense. Uso Sayamalo had his best game of the season by far on Saturday against BYU. So he and Damian Elaleo, if you can put some okay. trust and faith into those two guys, that's that's really helpful uh, in this game especially, but moving forward. Yeah, it'll be interesting how that unfolds because sometimes these things seem to be coming to a crescendo that it doesn't work out the way that it should. Mm -hmm. Like Kansas State's run defense, boy, they're <laughs> great. Oklahoma State's off rush offense, boy, it's not good. So you're like, well, if, uh, Ollie Gordon hasn't been able to run the ball all year. He's not going to be able to against Kansas State. He's probably the best run defense along with Utah that he's seen this year. And all of a sudden, you've seen this. It's weird. You know, weird crap happens. And all of a sudden, he has his best game. I will say this. He is not all of a sudden a bad football player. So at some point, he's going to break out. You hope it's not this weekend. Yeah, no doubt about it. All right, game picks time. I am taking the Cats 31, Oklahoma State 13. I think it is that big of a spread between them. So I, uh, I've i got faith in K-State. And like I said, their their loss was a little more fluky than what Oklahoma State's was last week. There were more reasons to be concerned about O-State even going into the start of Big 12 play. I don't think those get erased after what we saw last weekend. Uh, so I think K-State has a good day in front of the home crowd. Yeah, they're not as bad as it looked last week. It was a six-minute just dumpster fire obviously, but they're a better football team than that, markedly better football team than that. That's only like, and there was breakdowns at Tulane too, but they figured out a way to win and that just never happened <laughs> at, at BYU. Uh, but, you know, that was the first environment they played in of that kind, uh, at least a lot of those guys on the offensive side of the ball. I, I also have a, a comfortable win, 34 to 20, Kansas State. It's just, here's my problem. I don't think Oklahoma State's a good football team, and now they're going on the road and playing in the toughest probably road. I mean, are, they played at Arkansas, right? Was that in Fayetteville? So I'm sure Fayetteville was pretty rocking, obviously, too. That's a good environment. But I would probably say blindly that Kansas State's a better one, especially when they're going to get up for an Oklahoma State game probably more than an Arkansas team or an Arkansas fan base would. So you're asking me to put a team that I think is probably, like you said, a six to seven win team at best. Maybe it's more because the Big 12 has a lot of teams just like Oklahoma State. But I don't love Oklahoma State. You're, you're putting them in one of the better road environments in the Big 12 against the team that just got its butt kicked by BYU and wants to make a big response. And – Oklahoma State, I don't like their quarterback. They can't run the ball, and they're not playing defense. Like, what is there to like about Oklahoma State? I know, and if this comes back, and this will get thrown in my face. But I'm, but I'm serious. There's hard to like anything about Oklahoma State right now. Yeah, I agree with you. All right, that is uh, what we had to say before the game. We could be wildly wrong and have to wear it after the game. Uh, I guess it'll be early Saturday afternoon that we'll know the outcome and the truth to it. But K-State, this is a big one because as of now, they can still be a team that plays for the Big 12 title. A second loss, especially back-to-back -to, -back to start conference play, makes that math a whole lot harder to get figured out. If you want more pregame coverage and then live game coverage and all the postgame, go to On3, find kstateonline.com, be a member if you're not, and keep it locked in right here to the KSO YouTube and podcast platforms because we'll keep you in the know there as well. So for Derek Young, I'm Mason Vo. Thanks for watching the KSO Show. We'll be back again after the game on Saturday to recap the Cats and the Pokes.